Now that we have our business matters taken care of, we can move on to the more exciting portion of the evening, and that is our very special guest speakers. Uh, 2020, as many of you know, marks a lot of things, but one of the things it marks is the centennial of women's suffrage in the United States. And in honor of that anniversary, we are thrilled to be joined by Ms. Cynthia Tucker and Ms. Antoinette Broussard to learn more about a heroic figure in Washington's own history of women's and civil rights activism. And that's Dr. Nettie Asbury. Dr. Asbury was a pioneer in African-American civil rights leadership in Washington. She was one of the founding members of the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP and helped support the rise of African-American women's clubs in the Northwest, establishing the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Clubs, the first chapter west of the Rockies. So Dr. Asbury's home still stands in Tacoma's Hilltop neighborhood, and there is a growing interest in preserving the space to better interpret and share her story. So we are really thrilled to have with us two special guests who will tell us more about Dr. Asbury's life and accomplishments. So we'll hear from Ms. Cynthia Tucker, who is president of the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Clubs. She has been involved in multiple projects to better interpret and share African-American history and culture in the state of Washington, including an extensive oral history and research project on the Washington State Colored Women's Clubs in partnership with the Washington State History Museum. So Ms. Tucker is also the historian of the Asbury Culture Club. And then we'll hear from Ms. Antoinette Broussard, a researcher and writer whose work centers on documenting her ancestral roots. She is the author of African-American Holiday Traditions and her writing about her great aunt, Dr. Nettie Asbury, has appeared in the African-American National Biography, the Columbia Magazine, the Baobab Tree, Slavery's Descendants, Shared Legacies of Race and Reconciliation by Descendants of Enslavers and the Enslaved Anthology, and blackpast.org. And currently Antoinette is writing a book entitled Sweetwater, a personal history about Dr. Asbury's family. We are honored to have both Ms. Broussard and Ms. Tucker with us this evening to help share Dr. Asbury's work and legacy with you, our members and a wider audience. So with that, um, we may have a few discussions at the end of their presentations. So please do put any questions you have into the Q&A box. Um, and then now I want to introduce, and, and I forget how we, how we ended it. I'm not sure if, uh, if Cynthia, you were gonna go first or if Antoinette was gonna go first, but I'll let the two of you duke it out and decide. I'll go first. And... Great. Okay. So, you know, I only, as a child, I only knew her as Aunt Nettie. And I started researching my family um, uh, about 15 years ago, when my grandfather had left uh, these manuscripts, and they're going to put another picture up uh, on the screen of my, uh, here, it, here it is. So on the left is Violet Craig Turner. This is uh, Nettie Asbury's mother. Next is William P. Wallingford, who was Nettie's father. And Barry uh, Benjamin Craig was Nettie's, one of Nettie's uh, seven siblings. And so one day my mother asked me, after I had written my first book, she was going through her files and she asked me, she said, do you want these papers? They're your grandfather, who was talking about Barry Craig, they're his papers. And at the time I had no idea that my grandfather was a writer and he had written a story about his mother, uh, Violet Craig Turner, um, being enslaved in Platte County, Missouri by William P. Wallingford. Of course, the names were different. He put different names on them, but I knew exactly who he was talking about. And so, you know, when you start researching um, your family, you start also researching all the siblings. And Aunt Nettie was one of the people that I researched. And I had no idea about all of her accomplishments at the time. You know, like I said, I only knew her as Aunt Nettie. So as kids, because we're from Oakland, California, and a lot of her nieces, her nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews were all from the, from the Bay Area. And we would travel on the train to go see Aunt Nettie. And 
one of the things that stands out was that she had a beautiful uh, music room, a library. And, the, and this is, this is the um, library and it's where she taught music. She taught music for um, 50 years. She had recitals, annual recitals every year of 45 more, 45 or more students. And this room was her big, massive, upright piano, was um, her sheet music and her books that were in the bookcases, a lot of family photos and, and um, two um, leather chairs. And I just re remember being amazed by the beauty of this room, which was decorated with the Victorian wallpaper. And next door to the house was a vacant lot. And Aunt Nettie didn't want anybody particularly to live next door to her. And so she owned that lot and that's where we would play, we would play croquet. And that was just a fun time. She was very social and she would invite her friends over and to meet us and we would go outside and we would play croquet. She um, would come to the Bay Area sometime on the train to visit us. My grandfather, her um, brother, her youngest, um, well, he was uh, second to the youngest brother. He lived with us in, in Oakland, California. And one day she came and uh, I was uh, playing with my dolls. And she asked my mother, she said, well, why doesn't Tony, that's me, why doesn't Tony have a colored doll? Um, and my mother said, because all the colored dolls that she could find that were in the catalogs or in the stores had, were just, they were not beautiful dolls. They were not a positive image, she said, for me. They had a hideous look, their hair wasn't attractive. There was nothing attractive about them. And so she said, I never bought her a colored doll. And Aunt Nettie, not being from Oakland, California, though she had been in the Bay Area, traveled to the Bay Area numerous times, she went out and she found me this beautiful colored doll. And I'll always remember that. She was, the last thing I was to say about her, you know, when you knew Aunt Nettie was coming to visit or when you were going to visit Aunt Nettie, it was, you know, said in the family, just be on your best behavior. <laughs> she had a stern personality. You know, she was outspoken and she was determined. And I think what made her so outspoken and determined was what she saw her mother went through. Her mother had eight children by the man in the earlier photo by William P. Wallingford. She was enslaved by him. And Nettie was the only one, only one out of those eight children that was born free in 1865 when they got across that Missouri River into Leavenworth, Kansas from Platte County, Missouri. So, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Antoinette. And I think we're gonna to turn to Cynthia for a few words. And as they say, if we have time at the end, there'll be a couple of questions, hopefully. So thank you so much, Cynthia. Hi, yes. My name is Cynthia Tucker and I'm president of the Washington State Association of Colored Women's Clubs and the Tacoma City Association of Colored Women's Club, uh, president of both. Uh, a little history of who is the NACWC. They are the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. And how they got started in 1894, 95, a group of women across the United States were communicating with each other by mail. Now we all know the kind of mail they had by that. During that time, it's snail mail. So they were a little sick and tired a black man being hung um, mostly in the South. So they decided to form an organization to do something about it. 
So they, they put their little pennies together and those who couldn't come and attend to the meeting um, helped someone else in their neighborhood or community to attend this meeting that was going to be held in, in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. So they held a meeting there. They formed the club. It was called the Federation of Colored Women. The following year, they moved to Washington, D.C. and got their own building, which is where we are still today in that very same building. And they changed their name to a National Association of Women's uh, Clubs. Now, we are in 30, I think it's 38 states where we have colored women's clubs. We have conventions and uh, board meetings and all kinds of things. Some are done by virtually right now because of the virus, but normally it seems like every year we have a convention somewhere and that keeps us updated. One person I wanna mention who was a part of the National Association was Mrs. Mary Church Terrell. And she Oh, Cynthia, your, your mute button got turned on there by mistake. Take care of There me. we go. All righty. So Dr. Asbury formed many clubs within the state of Washington. She, there was three clubs under her. She also formed the National, the Tacoma chapter of the National Association, no, the Civil Rights Clubs. She also formed the Alum AME Red Cross. She also formed the Tacoma chapter of the NAACP in 1913. Um, she also formed, because she was a musician, she formed the Mozart Musical Club. She taught music in her home to anyone who wanted to learn music. Didn't matter who you were. Um, what your nationality was, anybody could learn to be, uh, to play instruments. So I am the president also, I got many hats, I got to take them off and on, <laughs> of the, the Dr. Nettie Asbury Cultural Club. Dr. Nettie formed that club and she also formed the Cloverleaf Art Club, which Today, the Dr. Nettie Asbury Culture Club is still active and we still have members. It's one of our main clubs. In fact, it has the most members of the three clubs that are remaining open. And so Dr. Nettie Asbury did all kinds of things in Tacoma. She, um, I've written a lot of this down because I didn't want to try to mess it up. <laughs> She taught her music lessons, like I said. Um, she was involved in civil rights. That was one of her passions. And she was a, a letter writer. So whenever there was something going on within the state, within government, whether it was federal or state or Pierce County, local, Seattle, Tacoma, she would write a letter uh, addressing any issues that pertain to what she was concerned about. Uh, she wrote a, a letter for the measure against interracial marriage, was, which was pushed through at the state legislature in Washington state. Um, and she had underground workers who let her know what was going on because as being a member of the, the uh, Tacoma City Association, we could not get involved in politics. It is against our bylaws. And even still today, we don't get involved in um, politics, but we can uh, allow, allow other groups to meet in our clubhouse and address the issues they are concerned about. So she was very, Dr. Asbury was creative with a pen. 
she wrote all those letters and and got changes going on within the commuting community. Um, she protested uh, the establishment of segregation at Fort Lewis. She wrote a letter in regards to the colonels and the generals there that took care of that. She served as a regional field secretary and later as a local branch uh, secretary. And she was the first ladies of colored America and published in a record book of her achievements. She also formed the Allen Red Cross and everybody know what the Red Cross stands for, the work that they do. Dr. Nettie Asbury was so much involved with the community. Anything that she could do to help people, to educate people, to, or to give them a, a reason to get out there and get busy, um, she was there. She, it, she was there forming clubs. She was there being involved in the clubs. Um, she just, not only did she form them, she was also involved in them. So she was very, quite busy. Um, a lot of those organizations are still going on today because of Dr. Nettie Asbury. Uh, over the years, she had been involved in 110 clubs. That's, that's a lot of club work. Uh, a lot of, of time you put in and invested in it to do good and to help people. Um, Dr. Nettie Asbury got enter into a sewing contest for the World's Fair. And she made this coat. She entered, uh, it was called a baton opera coat. And she entered it into the World's Fair and it won a prize, it won first prize. Now, after it won first prize, that same coat is hanging in the University of Washington. There's a room that they hold uh, hold it open for Dr. Nettie Asbury because she did so much in the state of Washington. So there's special collections there in her writings and in some of the things that she did. Um, and as you know, her home is still located in Tacoma, still standing. Um, we are hoping that someday the Tacoma City Association will be able to occupy that home, carry out her name and keep it as a, an investment site for the community where we can do something with the community and keep it involved in the community. I think she would be very proud um, of us for the Colored Women's Club and the Hilltop community. So that's all I have to say about Dr. Nettie Asbury. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia and Antoinette. I know there were a, a couple questions. One, one came up um, about Dr. Asbury's, Dr. Asbury's letters and other writings and whether they survive. And it sounds like that they are located. You can research them and find them at the special collections of the University of Washington. Is that correct? That is correct. Great. That's good to know for, for those aspiring Asbury historians and researchers that are out there. Um, and then I know it was such a compelling photograph, such a such a great photo of of um, uh, the parlor of the music room that was shown earlier. It's 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 like the the quintessential music teacher's room. Do any of those, any of that furniture, or any of the music, anything like that, still still survive or uh, pass down, Antoinette, maybe to the family at all? Well. We received a, a number of her things, but um, we didn't get any. We didn't get any of the music. And uh, Cynthia, don't you have some of the books from that room? Um, we have some. We do have some of the books, and we have some of her music sheets. Um, not, and of course, none of them that she wrote, but she did teach from them. And none of the furniture. We don't have any of the furniture. Um, I do believe her piano is one of our um, Hilltop members has it in his home. But as far as the club members are concerned and in the club building ourselves, we do not have any of her 
furniture. I wish we did, but we don't. Well, with with the piano, at least once, uh, hopefully, once the club is able to acquire and occupy the home, at least the piano can potentially go back to its rightful place. Yes, yes. We would love Great. to open up that home and have a music room as an exhibition because she did so much uh, for the community and she needs to be remembered for who she was and teaching the younger generation of the sacrifices that she made in um, the Tacoma, Washington State area. Well, I can certainly say that the Washington Trust commits any support we can provide to helping the club achieve that goal. Um, I think it would be wonderful uh, and something that, that everyone in Washington should know about and learn more of. So thank you both very much for your time with us this evening. As part of the members meeting, it was very special to have you and we appreciate your willingness to participate. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for inviting us. Yes. Of course.